Hello, everyone. My name is Tina Lining, and I am the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusive Excellence here in the School of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University. And we are super excited to have you for our Women's History presentation this afternoon. Um, we have our guest speaker here in the person of Dr. Lippy Roy. Dr. Roy is going to present this afternoon for 45 minutes. After she is done, we will open up the floor for anyone to ask questions. Should you have questions for her, she'll answer those for about 15, about 10 to 15 minutes. We're gonna get started with our presentation. Dr. Roy, are you there? Hi. Hi there. Hi, hi, hi. 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 It's How so are you? good. I'm good, it's so good to have you. I'm happy, so thrilled to be here. Yes, thank you. I'm gonna read your bio, any portion of your bio. Dr. Roy is gonna speak on the topic this afternoon, bias, bravery, burnout, the journey of women in medicine. This is an awesome opportunity, thank you. So Dr. Lippy Roy is an internal medicine and addiction medicine physician, keynote speaker, YouTube health show host, and a sought after media health commentator. Dr. Roy currently serves as medical director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, transitional housing sites at Housing Works in New York City. She also serves as clinical assistant professor at NYU at Langone Health and treats patients with opioid use disorder at St. Anne's Corner of Harm Reduction in the Bronx. Previously, Dr. Roy was a primary care doctor to Boston's homeless population, among whom the leading cause of death was drug overdose. She also serves, served as a, an attending physician at the Massachusetts General Hospital and as faculty at Harvard um, Medical School. Dr. Roy completed her medical and master's in health public health, excuse me, degrees at Tulane University, followed by residency training in internal medicine at Duke Medical Center. Dr. Roy actively merges her passion for medicine, traditional and medical media to educate and empower the public to make healthy choices. She is a Forbes contributor and former MSNBC and NBC News medical contributor. Dr. Roy, we welcome you and thank you for being present with us. Take it away. Well, thank you so much, Tina, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm gonna start sharing my screen and hopefully this will work just fine. Let me uh, enlarge this. Uh, Tina, give me a thumbs up if you can see it. Yep, perfect. Yeah, excellent, excellent, wonderful. Well, uh, I am so grateful and so honored uh, to be here. Uh, let me just, I just want to change something quickly on my, on my end. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, I am just so thrilled to be here. I'm so honored uh, to be invited by such a, a well-respected, highly respected institution. Um, and thank you, Tina, Miss Tina Lining, for the wonderful, generous invitation uh, to speak to all of you. Uh, as you can see by my the title, Bias, Bravery, and Burnout, Journey of Women in Medicine 2022 edition. Uh, this is a kind of a follow-up to my uh, article that I'd written for Thrive Global a few years ago. Uh, and for any of you who are uh, social media savvy, uh, feel free to take screenshots, pictures, tweet. I'm at Lippy Roy uh, for, on Twitter and at, at Lippy Roy MD on Instagram and TikTok. So um, I, as uh, Tina mentioned in my bio, I just launched a YouTube health show called Health, Humor, and Harmony. So clearly I take laughter very seriously and humor seriously. I mean, I put in the title of my show, uh, but so I'm gonna start the, the, today's talk with a, with a joke. So here it goes. What did the doctor say when her patient thought she had a bladder infection? Ding, 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 ding. You're in trouble. <laughs> so, anyway, I'm, I'm a big dork. So, but, but you know what? If you can't laugh at yourself, who can you laugh at? So, right. all right. So, um, so this is an outline of my, of my talk. Um, I'm actually going to start a little bit with uh, Case Western's legacy and tradition with, regarding women in medicine. Uh, women in medicine then and now, COVID-19 impact on women, challenges and opportunities, women and leadership, 
broader women's advocacy and activism and self-care, which is so important to me. And so I'm gonna share with you some of the things that I do, uh, some acknowledgements and resources that I hope that all of you will find helpful. So Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine clearly has a proud legacy. Um, uh, women in medicine, there are many, many impactful, uh, uh, successful alumni. Um, Emily Blackwell, who was the second woman to earn a medical degree at what's now called Case Western. Uh, Nancy Talbot Clark in 1852 was the second woman to earn a medical degree in the United States after Elizabeth Blackwell. And of course, Emily Blackwell is Elizabeth's sister. And a bit more recently, a graduate a class of 71, uh, Nancy Caroline was a co-founder of Freedom House and she devoted her entire career to serving the underserved. And then more recently, Julie Gerberding, um, Dr. Gerberding uh, was uh, the first female director of the Centers for Disease Control uh, and Prevention. And uh, on a more personal note, and perhaps the most recent graduate of this, of the women that I'll be showing you is Dr. Krista Swisher, class of 07, triple boarded neurology, neurophysiology, and neurocritical care. Uh, I first met Krista when I was a lowly little medicine intern, uh, no offense to any interns who are watching now, but uh, medicine intern at Duke. And Krista was my neurology resident. And when you're on the neurology service, my first time on, a, or on the service, being bombarded with one, uh, one a, a neuro consult after another, after another, it was so reassuring to have a calm, confident, intelligent, and compassionate presence in the form of Dr. Krista Swisher. As my neuro resident, she's like, oh, Lippy, there's a stroke code. Oh, let's go and check that out. Oh, here's a, this person needs a, an LP. Let's go do that together. I, I mean, she just embodied mentorship. And I'm so grateful to this day. I'm very good friends with Krista and um, she is a very proud uh, alum of uh, Case Western School of Medicine. So a little bit about the journey of, of women in the field of medicine back then. Women traditionally and historically served as caregivers for families and communities. It was only recently, however, that they were allowed into the ranks of formal medical practitioners. About 200 to 400 uh, common era, a Greek physician of Egyptian origin by the name of Dr. Cleopatra Metrodora uh, was the author of the oldest medical text written by a woman called On the Diseases and Cures of Women. And here she is, um, who spent her career really devoted to gynecology. And then in 1849, as many of you know, know, Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell became the first woman to receive a medical degree in the United States. Among the many, many disparaging comments uh, and pushback that she received, one of them was that she was ostracized by educators, educators and patients alike. And then after her in 1864, Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler became the first black woman to earn a medical degree and uh, faced innumerable um, disparaging, disrespectful and, and racist comments. And one of them was that, that she encountered ferocious racism in the post-war post South. I believe she was in Virginia. In 1850, the first US Medical College for Women only had eight graduates. And then by 1900, women made up about five and a half percent of the physician workforce. And this number actually remained stagnant throughout the first half of the 20th century. 1900, 5.5%. And now women make up 50.5%, a little over half of all medical school enrollees. And this is as of 2019. Women make up 80% of the healthcare workforce. Women led the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic, mostly driven by nursing, but also doctors and other allied healthcare professionals. And now women in medicine really have uh, impact in all sectors, academia, research, government, technology, global health, media. And here's just a few, few examples from Dr. Kismikia Corbett played a critical role in the discover the COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, Dr. Karen DeSalvo, who's the Chief Health Operating Officer, Chief Health Officer of um, Google. Uh, Dr. Ingvid Olsen, who's at SAMHSA. Uh, Dr. Joya Mukherjee, one of the co-founders of Partners in Health. 
and my, my wonderful colleagues in uh, MSNBC, Dr. Kavita Patel and Dr. Nahid Bedalia, uh, having uh, clinical, successful clinical practices, academia, and uh, in media. So I think we have a lot to lot of achievements that I think we really should celebrate. These are tremendous accomplishments that we have all made collectively, individually and collectively under um, insur almost insurmountable barriers, but we overcame and that really very much should be celebrated. But we still have a ways to go, more on that later. But in the meantime, we had something, this little thing called COVID-19. Let me first share a little bit about my pandemic experience and maybe a parts of it will resonate with some of you. It's been a tough 24 months for all of us, uniquely so for frontline healthcare workers. I worked three different clinical positions. I was the medical director of COVID isolation quarantine sites for a year and a half. I treated opioid addiction once a week in the Bronx. I also worked at, um, oversaw medical, uh, vac uh, medical services at uh, various city and state run vaccination sites. So I was essentially on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I also made about 300, over 300 live appearances for various television networks, mostly NBC and MSNBC, uh, as well as China Global Television, Newsy, I did radio and I wrote for Forbes. In addition, I did a lot of virtual consulting and speaking. Uh, suffice to say, with all of that, in addition to my own personal life and domestic duties, uh, I absolutely was burning out. And I'm sure parts of this will resonate with many, many of you, if not all of you. So COVID-19's impact on girls and women. The pandemic deepened pre-existing gender inequalities and exposed vulnerabilities in social, political, and economic systems. Economic distress was felt harder by women and girls who generally earn less, save less, and hold insecure jobs or live close to poverty. Unpaid work increased during the pandemic. More children were at home. Um, there were increased needs of the elderly uh, and overwhelmed healthcare systems. And of course, it was women who bear the brunt of that unpaid work. Gender-based violence increased exponentially as women were forced to lock down with their abusers while support survivor support services were disrupted. And globally, whenever there's a pandemic or any type of crisis or war, girls, the first thing that happens is that girls are yanked out of schools and, and, and uh, forced into uh, the workforce or early marriage. And UN Women pre predicted that about 13 million more girls were at risk uh, of becoming child brides during uh, the pandemic. So we have come a long way, but there's more to do some of the many ongoing challenges. Women make up only 36% of the physician workforce in 2019, despite making up over half of medical school enrollees. Women make up only 40% of executives, despite representing 80% of the healthcare workforce. Women are offered less in starting salary, less in awards and other recognitions, fewer speaking invitations and research funding and burnout, as I mentioned earlier, and I'll talk about how to address this, burnout among female physicians was an epidemic well before COVID-19. Female physicians burn out faster than their male colleagues. 50% of female physicians reported symptoms of burnout versus 39% of their male colleagues. And that, that work-life balance or integration, full-time working women spend eight and a half additional hours per week on domestic duties compared to about, I think, six hours for, for men. And then gender bias and discrimination. Over 70% of women physicians reported experiencing gender discrimination from disparaging and disrespectful comments to lack of promotion or awards. Women physicians consistently earn less than their male counterparts uh, across specialties, despite similar, um, similar uh, product academic and clinical productivity. Women physicians are less likely to speak at grand rounds and more likely to be introduced informally. So male physicians will be introduced by the, the hosts or the chair of tournament as, oh, this is Dr. John Smith. But women physicians will be presented as, introduced as, 
this is Linda Chang, uh, even though that she is either a, 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 either a chief resident or chief of a division. But there is hope. And that is why I, I, I remain absolutely optimistic uh, with what our, our future holds. Uh, and this is why I spend uh, the time and effort to give talks like this, to meet all of you virtually and hopefully in future in person, because I firmly believe that individually and collectively, we will continue to rise above and make a truly impactful difference. So women leaders perform exceptionally well. Studies show that um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, countries with female leaders had better COVID-19 outcomes. They had better coordinated responses, more empathy for their people. US states with female leaders also had better COVID-19 outcomes as far as having lower infection rates and lower mortality rates. And this is a picture of a uh, New Zealand Prime Minister um, uh, Jacinda Ardern, who many, many uh, publications have shown that she led her country very well and, and her country had very, very positive outcomes. So why, why is this? Why is it that women leaders do so well? Well, and by the way, a, a lot of the data that I'm sharing with you was presented by Dr. Helen Burstyn, and I'll talk a little bit about her uh, as the talk goes on. Well, women are more likely to have better coordinated policy responses. Women are more willing to make tougher calls, such as stay-at-home orders, which I think all of you know was highly unpopular, but it was evidence-based. Women are more likely to listen to trusted health experts and scientific experts. Women are more likely to possess more empathy for the well-being of their constituents. And women possess qualities of transformational leaders, vision, inspiration, direction setting, and out of the box thinking. So uh, I don't know if you can read this. Um, this lovely male companion says to her female companion, let me interrupt your expertise with my confidence. <laughs> I'm sure all of you have experienced something to this effect uh, at some point in your uh, education and career. I, God knows I have. Turns out that charm and confidence may help a person achieve a top position, but empathy and humility are critical to leadership. So Dr. Helen Burstyn, uh, really highly respected, highly accomplished uh, physician uh, and CEO of the Council of Medical Specialty Societies, which represents over 800,000 physicians. Uh, she presented a, an amazing talk at the Women in Medicine Summit last fall, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But in that presentation, she talked about how we can collectively get more women into leadership positions intentional sponsorship and mentorship by senior leaders, transparent search in the, uh, in, in the recruitment process uh, and beyond just the expected or usual suspects or candidates, Help, helping women break through the glass ceilings and the concrete roofs and help avoid the glass cliffs for women leaders and addressing gender and racial inequities by developing policies that counter institutional racism and bias. And I, I also want to talk about Dr. Shika Jane, who is one of the was a, is the co-founder of sorry founder of Women in Medicine and is a very successful uh, internist and hematologist oncologist uh, in Chicago. She uh, has this wonderful phrase, lift as you, uh, as you rise, prioritize, determine what you need to be doing, delegate, identify strengths and weaknesses in others, motivate, help each team member fulfill tasks that are best suited to their skill set, and set them up for success set up goals, uh, objectives, attainable goals, objectives, and realistic deadlines. And then objective reviews, give regular feedback. Now just look at that list. It just, just talking about it, you can tell it's, it's a lot of work and it is, right? The, you know, all of you at, at your various levels of your training and careers, you worked pretty damn hard to get to where you are. And the hard work doesn't stop. 
right? But but part of leadership is is delegating, is also recognizing what you knowing what you don't know and helping, you know, creating a team of people who can help you, who can fill those gaps in your knowledge, because we all have gaps, but surrounding yourself by solid people or people that you identify as having potential. Uh, you know, the, uh, when I think back to my mentors, uh, past and present, that they they provide that they provide that empathy that that compassion that patience they take time out of their busy schedules to mentor me to listen to me to hear me vent um, and to and to identify my strengths and foster those so you know lifting others as you rise in your own career um, takes time and effort but it's so going to be worthwhile. So I want to take a moment to share uh, some of the stories and advice of, from some of my mentors. Um, Dr. Kelly Clark is um, a, a psychiatrist by training. Uh, you can see the many letters behind her name, MBA, um, a, a distinguished fellow of the American Society of Addiction Medicine, uh, business leader, and she's a past president of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. And she says, among lots of, uh, uh, tremendous impactful advice that she's given. She says, don't stand alone with any work or career related power structures. Reach up and across and down. Help and mentor others. Ask and take whatever mentoring you can value. I also want to share um, sagely and, and more, more perhaps philosophical advice given by one of my mentors former colleagues at Harvard Medical School and a dean, of uh, uh, one of the deans at Harvard Medical School, Dean uh, Nancy Oriel. My journey was helped and or hindered at various times by my gender. When I reflect on any moment and try to tease out the threads that caused it to be a success or failure, it was like looking at an Escher paint, a print where perspective is not static. And the more I looked, the more difficult it was to assign a cause or follow a thread. And that I think is a strength. It allowed me to have many different ways of making sense of any moment. Dr. Oriel, is, um, uh, she was um, one of the uh, 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 faculty associate, she's now a faculty associate dean at Harvard Medical School, and she was co-creator of the Family Van, which provided much needed medical services to underserved populations throughout Boston, Cambridge, and other parts of Massachusetts. Um, Nancy remains a friend and mentor to not only faculty uh, like me attending physicians, but also to, to rising students uh, and trainees. And uh, I'm just so grateful to, to Nancy's ongoing leadership. So um, I really wanna, uh, I'd be remiss if I did not spend a little bit of time addressing burnout. So, I actually wrote an article about burnout uh, during the pandemic, um, specifically how it targeted uh, women and, and women on, on, at, the, at the front lines of, of the, the health uh, of the pandemic. And, uh, you know, one of the ways that we address a burnout initially, at least was, you know, building more resilience among physicians, both men and women, um, making a just making us stronger and, build, and building resilience within us individually and collectively. And while that's a part of it, it doesn't really address the larger problem, which is more systemic and structural um, uh, deficiencies. So how healthcare leaders can fix our broken healthcare system. Uh, and the, a lot, some of this advice was given by, by the way, at the bottom of all of my slides are, are references and I'll share more resources at the end. So some suggestions here, really increasing support services in, in all aspects, uh, clinical, academic, um, administrative, and many, many others. Uh, focusing on decreasing the demands, decreasing administrative burdens on healthcare workers, on doctors and others, uh, de decreasing many other demands, um, leading by example as physician leaders, as female physician leaders, um, lead by example by tending to your own well-being and, and, and making a point of that, saying, hey, I got to leave by five o'clock, by whatever time, because I got to go to my child's recital. I got to attend to my 
uh, husband's needs. I gotta, I gotta go to my own coffee pot and work out, you know, be open and transparent about that rather than being ashamed and creating listening mechanisms, uh, opportunities for feedback, both uh, in person or anonymously, uh, digitally, paper, in whatever format, but getting that feedback tells uh, people on the, on the, on the, you know, the, our constituents, our team members, tells them, wow, our leaders actually care. They care about what I think. Increasing communication, all forms of communication. Everything's in it. We're living in a virtual world now, right? Because of the pandemic, which has pros and some cons, but creating increasing communication through Zoom meetings, in-person meetings, email, written form, uh, various ways, social media, uh, many, many ways to increase communication. And elevating transparency in terms of what your missions are, what your division, your department's goals are. And then nurturing a sense of community and belonging. So many ways to do that. Case Western has already done that. Having a, a, a office of diversity, equity, inclusion, um, having other fun activities. You know, we we are not just our work. As meaningful as our work is, we are so many other aspects. We are painters and and pianists and and runners and so many other things that you know these other activities bring us tremendous joy and fulfillment and that should be um, uh, incorporated into our work lives and I think it's also really important for us as physicians particularly as women physicians women leaders in healthcare to set boundaries it's okay not only is it okay, but it's really mandatory to say no. Learn when to say no. Learn to identify what your own boundaries are personally, academically, and professionally. And even if it takes using a trigger to prompt you to leave clinic, leave work, like making sure you turn off the, 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 the light switch, uh, making sure you pull that doorknob close, um, you know, uh, multiple examples. And those are just a few little ones that, that uh, Lori Betke talks about. And then using intention and mindfulness to physically and mentally shift from work to home. Maybe when you're driving home, you know, put, put listening to an audiobook or putting up photographs of your children, your significant other, of yourself, uh, of yourself at a, at, a, at a play or at a Broadway musical or at a, a sporting event, um, photos of your kids, whatever brings you a sense of joy and peace and happiness and bliss that's not work related. All of these little things, they may seem trivial, but collectively they add up and they bring meaning to your lives, to all of our lives. And I have to talk about self-care. Self-care is just so key. It is absolutely critical. Um, and I, I wish we, we talked about, I wish I learned more about this as I was going through my, my training, um, but I, I, I know it now. And this is, I'm gonna share with you just a few of the things that I do and that studies show have been effective um, at, at, at reducing burnout. Uh, and I have to emphasize that self-care is not selfish. Uh, there, these are just a few examples of healthy ways to cope with stress. <laughs> so first of all, this 24 hour seven news cycle is not good. It's so important to take breaks from watching the news. Um, caring for your body in so many different ways, meditate, eating healthy, getting sufficient sleep, getting vaccinated and boosted. And I didn't add here, you know, spa treatments, getting a manicure, pedicure, massage, get these things. They are really helpful. Um, unwinding and for hobbies, things that you enjoy, working out, exercising, reading, cooking, baking, listening to music, playing instruments, writing, other forms of art, painting, drawing. And then connecting with others. Again, when we were in lockdown, we weren't able to uh, you know, meet in person, but we were able to talk on the phone, use Zoom or Skype. And now that you know, numbers in terms of COVID cases are going down, hospitalization deaths are going down, we're now slowly opening up safely, vaccination rates are gone, going up, spending time with people you love of people you trust, people who make you feel better. Um, that really makes a tremendous difference. And I'll share with you some of the things that I do. I meditate for 20 minutes every morning. 
I cook in the evenings, not every night, but I cook on weekends and I make enough to uh, you know, store for the week. Uh, I go out for walks. I go out to meet friends at restaurants. I go out on my own. I sit at sports bars. I go out at cafes. I take a book or my laptop. Um, I, I play sports. I work out. I either go to the gym or I work out at home. I love cardio kickboxing and um, Pilates and yoga. Um, I also, you know, I've talked about comedy in the beginning and humor. Humor is a big part of my life. After a long, stressful day, I like winding down by watching some of my favorite sitcoms, Big Bang Theory, The Mindy Project, Will and Grace, Golden Girls, uh, late night comedy, you know, and a lot of uh, stand up comedians and comedy movies um, and just movies in general. The Oscars are coming up this Sunday. Um, I will be watching it. I These are just some of the things that I do. I also spend time with people that are part of my community, that are part of my my circle that just that just uplift me and who I, I uplift as well. Um, it's so so important. There's a common saying in the addiction field, which is the opposite of addiction isn't sobriety, it's connection. So those one-on-one -on -one and group connections really have a meaningful and lasting impact. And there's no uh, that absolutely applies to uh, the, the medical field and within your own circles and your own academic and medical um, uh, uh, fields. So I also want to point out three notable issues. I, I have been using the term women in medicine, um, and but I'm not just referring to doctors. I'm really referring to physicians, nurses, allied health professionals, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, researchers, scientists, public health advocates, all of us collectively. Um, and I also need to point out that Black, Hispanic, Native American, and other marginalized groups are under-mentored in medicine. We need to address racial and gender inequities through mentorship, sponsorship, and promotion. And we also need to find supportive, strong and supportive male allies. I have many male role models for whom I am immensely grateful. In turn, I mentor and sponsor female and male students and trainees. Um, this is a photograph of uh, Dr. Richard Sates um, uh, at the Immersa conference, which is an addiction medicine conference. Um, Dr. Sates is not only uh, my, my, my mentor, he was my former colleague at Boston Medical Center um, and uh, a good friend. He sadly passed away uh, from pancreatic cancer just a month, month and a half ago. Uh, and this is Dr. Dinesh Patel, um, an orthopedic surgeon retired from Master General Hospital, um, who remains a tremendous role model to me uh, personally and, and professionally. So women's advocacy, you know, we are not alone here. We, we are, and, and just, we're not, it's just not the medical field here. Uh, so many women in so many sectors have been uh, fighting with the feminist movement uh, for fighting for gender equity. And this is just a small sampling of incredible women that are here today fighting on behalf of women's rights uh, and gender equity from Gloria Steinem, actresses like uh, Emma Watson, Angela Davis, um, sports figures like Billie Jean King, um, a, a former UN ambassador, Angelina Jolie, Malala, uh, a, a tremendous author of Chimanda Ngozi Adichie, Tarana Burke, founder of the Me Too movement, Mindy Kaling, and um, uh, performers, artists like Mary J. Blige. There's so many others. I, there just aren't enough slides to really show this to you. But I, I wish I had known uh, uh, more about what these strong women and, and impactful women were doing, but that's okay. I'm learning now and I wanna be able to ally and partner with all of these um, women individually and collectively joining these groups, advocacy groups. And by the way, advocacy does not mean you have to devote five, 10 hours a day. It could be even two minutes writing a, a, a letter to your- <laughs> What did you do, Jack, look. Sorry, uh, just want to make sure. Okay, sorry. I thought I was going to drop um, You know, it could be two minutes, uh, you know, writing a, an email to your congressperson, your senator, um, a, a sending a, a donation to your favorite charity. Um, it could be uh, so many different ways going to a protest, a demonstration, writing signs, so many ways that you can all be impactful. 
Uh, so I really want to take time and effort to acknowledge uh, Christina Marini, who was my research assistant and who uh, helped me with um, a lot of the content, not only in this, this presentation, but also in my YouTube health show uh, and various people. Um, uh, here's just a small, small list of people. And of course, I got to include my own mom, um, her grandfather, and a physician. Um, she herself is such a, she's a retired banker at uh, TD Bank, and she remains one of my biggest uh, role models and fa fans. Um, and of course, this is a picture of my good friend, Dr. Krista Swisher, when she came to visit in New York. Um, and then many, many resources. This is again, just a small list, um, Black Women's Health Imperative, Center for Reproductive Rights, Georgetown, Global Fund for Women, so many um, uh, organizations that can provide a lot of more detailed data uh, behind a lot of the pres uh, my presentation. And um, I just wanna uh, leave you with a lasting sense of hope. Remember, there are no hopeless situations only people who are maybe thinking hopelessly at that moment. And so on that note, I want to thank each and every one of you for joining, for listening. You can all email me if you have questions or comments at nyulango.org. You can tweet me, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and please feel free to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Health, Humor, and Harmony. And on that note, I think I will stop sharing and I will uh, send it back to Tina. Outstanding, outstanding. Let's give her a round of applause. All the clapping, clapping, clapping. Outstanding, Leppy Roy. Thank you, Dr. Roy. We appreciate your contribution to Case Western Reserve and this work and our first Women's History Month program in the, from the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusive Excellence. And that is on behalf of not only myself, but Dean Gerson and um, our, uh, our Vice Dean of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusive Excellence in the person of Dr. Blanton Tolbert. So we are so appreciative of you. And we wanna open up the floor. Are there questions? If you have a question, you can unmute yourself and jump right in and ask her a question. We have a few more minutes. Gallery view. You can unmute yourself. Um, I just wanted to say that like this presentation was just so like raw and insightful and um, I am an undergraduate student. My, I'm a freshman at Case Western and I was wondering um, when you were like an undergraduate student like does maybe like 12 years plus of schooling um, does it ever seem daunting to you and like what are some specific day-to-day -day examples that you experience burnout and like how do you mitigate that yeah what's your name serena serena thank you so much first of all thank you for attending this talk and thank you for your really sweet uh, supportive comments i really appreciate it and um oh i'm so excited for you oh undergrad <laughs> so exciting well you know first of all some recommendations i would make just thinking back um Participate in clubs, participate in whatever you enjoy. Uh, find uh, whether it be uh, the crochet club or knitting or, or, or you know, yachting or, uh, you know, sp squash, whatever you enjoy, you know, because that's where you're going to find people who are like minded, um, who you're going to, you're going to find your, 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 your network that way. So, um, and that's what I did. But at the same time, you also, at the other end of the spectrum, you don't want to become overwhelmed. You don't want to take on too much you don't want to you know you and, and and again that's like trial by trial and error you figure out what you have time for um what you have the energy for you know women uh when it comes to burnout men and women both face burnout women face burnout in the form of emotional exhaustion and men face it more in terms of depersonalization so you know i i think looking back and yeah after all those years of training you know i i think for me the burnout was just in in terms of internalizing the stress and of, of a, a deadline is due, a presentation is due, exams, midterms. Um, and I think now looking back, um, 
it, it really comes down to, and this is no secret, it's preparation, really. Um, you know, Miss Tina Lining will tell you that when she told me about this presentation a, couple, a few, several months back, and I started preparing for this presentation really several weeks ago. Um, and, and if you think about the content, it was really probably months, if not years in the making, uh, technically. But I think, you know, getting getting a lot, plenty of sleep. Um, when I tell some of my colleagues and friends that I make sure, I make a point to get seven to seven and a half hours of sleep every night. Some of them just laugh at me. My friends that are in journalism that do you know, reporting around the world, they're like, Lippy, that's I can never get that. I'm lucky if I get five. I'm like, I, I hear you, I get that. But just, just know that you know, chronic sleep deprivation is associated with every chronic illness from heart disease, diabetes, cancer to Alzheimer's. So I make it a point to really just take care of myself, getting a lot of sleep, drink plenty of fluids, eating regular meals, exercising. That's kind of what I do. And then having a good connection of, uh, of people to kind of support me and, 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 and take and help me along. So I hope that answers your question. That was great. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you so much. Next question. I think I might be next. Hi, my name is Emma Perez Navarro. I'm currently a laboratory technician at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, I'm doing like a gap year. So I'm trying to figure out what I wanna do next. And I wanted to ask what were steps or checkpoints, I guess, that made you move on to get like a medical degree and a particularly in public health, which is something that I'm interested in getting a master's in. Yeah, thank, thank you, Emma, for that question. Thank you for being a researcher and doing all that great work. You know, I, um, I, I, I did not have a direct journey to, to, to medicine. I, um, I, I, um, you know, and, and everyone's journey is different. In my case, I just kind of I figure out over over time what a what I'm good at and what I enjoy, and it's it's if you can ideally find a career path where you can merge both of those things, finding things that you're good at and things that you enjoy. Uh, I discovered I, I was initially working in a lab, and um, and I, I I got to meet other fellow you know scientists who were you know older to me, senior to me, uh, who were great mentors. Um, but I also realized that at least me personally. I, I, I enjoyed talking to people, people and meeting people. So being in a lab um, for me was a little isolating. Um, you know, looking back, I wish I had formed more communities with other scientists and did other things. But I just realized that I was really fascinated by things like um, international health, global health, tropical diseases. And so I was actually going to go into infectious diseases. But I also realized that um, I kind of wanted to go back to school. And I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I thought maybe, I, I, maybe I'll do an MBA. Maybe I'll do a PhD. Maybe I'll do an MPH. I wasn't really sure. But part of that journey is talking to people, um, maybe reaching out to people. Now the beauty of e email and, and social media, it's so easy to reach out to people and ask them questions about what do they enjoy? What, what's their day-to-day -day work life like? Work life balance, what's that like? Um, and then asking, hey, can I shadow you? Do you have other tips for me, suggestions? That's a great way to get some sense of what a, a certain a career would look like, whether it be in public health or global health, um, in medicine, science, research, academia, uh, pharma, uh, biotech, or, 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 or otherwise. Um, and for me, I, I actually, my intro to um, infectious disease or medicine more broadly, I had pneumonia as a six-year-old and I was hospitalized. Uh, and then years later, uh, and it was pretty severe. My mom and dad just did not think I was going to make it. And then years later, when I was about the age of 11, I got malaria and I was hospitalized for, for, for several, about a week. Again, it was severe fevers, chills, 104 temperature. Um, uh, luckily, you know, I, I was at the time in Toronto. I'm actually in Toronto now. Um, and I got really excellent medical care, medical attention, and I did fine. But that really put me on a path of learning more about tropical diseases. Um, and, uh, and so that just put me on that path. I ended up being going to internal you know, I did my MD and, and my MPH, and I did internal medicine. 
I did not stop specializing in, in infectious disease because I realized what I was really interested in was global health, but, um, but you can do global health from any, any specialty. Uh, and you certainly don't have to be a physician to do, do global health uh, either. So, but anyway, I hope that answers a little bit of your, of your question. No, that was perfect. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Emma. Thank you so much. Are there other questions? Uh, Dr. Roy, you spoke of the challenge that underrepresented um, folk have with getting mentors. What advice would you say to someone having a challenge with connecting or finding a mentor? Yeah, thank you for asking that, Tina. Uh, you know, I there's a couple of different things. I don't think there's any right or wrong, but there's a lot of good, good data out there in terms of what's been successful, what kind of types of programs have been successful. Um, if uh, just thinking about for, for me and some of my friends and colleagues uh, and co-med students and co former residents uh, who are black or women of color, reaching out to other women of color. Uh, that's really one of the first things. And, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily even be your specific race or ethnicity, reaching out to other people uh, of other races and ethnicities, Hispanic, Native American, Asian, uh, you know, because their journeys uh, are very similar in terms of the, the, the obstacles, not identical. That's why it's important to try to reach out to it, it, the individual uh, women in, in, in your particular uh, race or ethnicity. Uh, send an email, send, make a phone call, go visit their office, um, reach out. And if no one at your particular institution, then maybe other institutions or reaching out to other people um, yeah, you know, through social media. There's so many ways, but taking that first step is so key. And you know, look, early on in my career, I was um, very nervous. I was very intimidated. The idea of reaching out to a professor, uh, a, a, a chair of a division, uh, or, or a, anyone like that, highly intimidating for me. Yes. But, but I, I, I will tell you, now that I have the, the, the wisdom of these years, you know, what's the worst that'll happen? Either they won't write back, or they'll say no. And you know what? That's okay. That's okay, because people are busy. People sometimes forget, They're, they get overwhelmed by emails. Uh, they are, are behind in their voicemails. That's okay, never take it personally. And yeah. if that person says, no, I just can't, then you move on, you move on to somebody else. There is no shortage of people out there who are willing and able to help you. So that is my, my other key advice, never give up. Never yeah. give, up. give up. Never give up. Thank you for that. There is a question in the chat and, the, and it's asking, given that medicine is such a hierarchical field, how do you suggest medical students advocate for themselves in situations where they may be disadvantaged to do so during clinical rotations when they are being um, evaluated? Yeah, um, uh, Miss Isabel Ho asked this. Uh, thank you, Isabel, for that question. Yes. Uh, what, a, what a great one. Uh, I, I, I'm gonna uh, assume there are people on this uh, call right now um, uh, in this meeting who've, um, you know, who've been through training uh, at the same time as me in the past five to 10 years, and if not longer ago, 20, 30 years ago. Um, medicine still is very much hierarchical, and, and when they say that, it's really patriarchal, uh, really, at, at its core. Um, things are a lot better today than they were uh, 40, 50 years ago, um, or even 5, 10 years ago. So institutions are recognizing a lot of these uh, problems, a lot of these uh, paternalistic uh, legacy problems, even the call schedule. You know, there was a time I was on 30 hour call before me, it was 36 hours. And then after you finished call, you were expected to go to clinic. Um, the way we were treated, attendings, attendee physicians, talking down, berating, this idea of like, you know, getting pimped, uh, you know, the, the, the terminology that we use is very uh, disparaging, to be honest. Lots of things that we say, even in, in the addiction medicine field, we still use words that are very stigmatizing, uh, like a junkie, addict, alcoholic, it's just very, so 
part of this changing the vocabulary that we use, but also, you know, if you're on the, say on the student end or on the trainee end, say on the lower end of the spectrum, and they put that in quotes because I really, I, I'm trying to move away from this hierarchy. Um, everyone should feel empowered to speak up. Um, and if not in a group setting, then maybe pulling, say, a, a fellow uh, or an attending aside. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable talking to the attending because you know that attending is going to be evaluating you, then maybe going to the, 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 another professor uh, at, in the department, in the School of Medicine, going to somebody else, um, maybe talking to another medical student or another, another fellow student, another a graduate student, sp speaking to somebody in the in the institution or even going outside your institution, but don't keep it to yourself. Yeah. You know, we all have struggles. We all um, uh, are spoken to in a manner or treated in a manner that's disrespectful, that's hurtful. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's so important to just not keep it to yourself. If that first person that you talk to is your mom or your boyfriend, your significant other, then get it out. Um, mm -hmm. But then follow, really don't, don't keep it to yourself. And then as institutions, we really need to um, be very mindful of, of this. Let, let's be honest, I will say, there's going to be a certain element of hierarchy in medicine just because of what it is, just like military, it's, it's hierarchical because of the way that the training process goes. Um, and so, and if you're on the uh, kind of lower end, don't take things personally. Um, uh, if it's not meant in a way that's a personal, but it, rather educational. But yeah, there's ways, um, there's room for improvement on all uh, um, um, ends of that spectrum, uh, Tina. Awesome. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you, Isabel, for that, that question. Are there any more questions before we close the session? This has been outstanding, Dr. Roy, outstanding. Any other questions? I'm so happy. And people, again, are free to email me, reach out to me. They can, of course, reach out to you, Tina, and then you can then share the comments with me, uh, but, and also use social media. I'm, I'm happy to address and hear feedback uh, in terms of the content and um, other relevant issues. Yes, and we have recorded this session for those of you who may want um, to view it later. Um, I think we have a question. No? That was me just saying thank you. I'm very appreciative of the session. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Tina, for organizing it. Oh, no worries. I'm, I'm so happy that you were able to come. I know that you're very busy, but we, we really appreciate you. And we look forward to having you on campus. <laughs> having you on campus. I, so. I would love that because so many of my friends and colleagues who live in the Cleveland area and who are at Case, they're like, they're like, oh, are you going to come in? For, no, maybe next time. And I'd just yes. want to shout out to Dr. Nancy Oriel, who joined from Harvard. I'm so honored that she was part of this presentation as well. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, again, on behalf of Case West Reserve and the School of Medicine and the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusive Excellence, we indeed thank you. We honor you and appreciate you and your contribution, not just to us, but to diversity and equity in medicine for all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you all. Thank you so much. Yes, thank <laughs> you all for attending. <laughs>